Well, uh, before I actually go to, to the topic of uh, this talk today, let me advertise uh, very briefly uh, a new paper that has been posted on archive just this Monday, uh, since there were quite lots of interest in this 200 to 3 model last week. Uh, we thought maybe it's, uh, it's a good uh, idea to wrap up uh, our old project, and uh, so it's now on archive. Uh, again, we continue studying uh, a spin one model with next nearest neighbor interaction, also three side interaction, but now not restricting ourselves to a positive science of coupling, but considering the complete phase diagram. And as you can see, we see a bunch of uh, interesting critical phenomena, such as Ising transition, also in case of ferromagnetic nearest neighbor interaction, coastal transition, etc. So if you're interested, you're very welcome to look at this blueprint and discuss. But OK, let's forget about it for now. So come back to uh, yet another application of GMRGs. Two of them I started discussing last week. And now it's another extension of what one can do uh, with, uh, with standard GMRG technique, how one can extend it. And what I'm going to discuss today is an implementation of hard constraint, local constraint into DMRG, so we can fully profit from the restricted Hilbert space. And uh, I'm going to discuss about various constraint models in 1D. Uh, the work has been done uh, uh, under support by Swiss National Science Foundation and in collaboration with Frederick Miller. So here is the uh, scope of the talk today. I'll start with the introduction to constraint model and I'll uh, first introduce you the model which you're probably familiar with from uh, studying from uh, undergraduate courses. This is quantum dimer model. We have seen it already a couple of times in the context of uh, 2D, but now I'll introduce how one can actually define it in 1D. Uh, but then I'll show that in 1D actually this quantum dimer model can be explicitly mapped onto other constraint models such as quantum, oh, sorry, hard boson models, quantum loop, uh, and Fibonacci anions models. Such different models studied for a long time in the context of uh, different contexts, uh, also with exact degradation is and DMRG, now can be actually mapped rigorously onto each other. And then I'll proceed to numerics. I'll show how one can actually implement uh, local constraint directly into DMRG. So it's example of non-abelian symmetry, but in very different ways than usually people understand non-abelian symmetry in the context of DMRG. And then, as a physical result, I'll present a phase diagram for all these models <coughs> that contains very long-standing <coughs> problem of presence of floating phase and or chiral transitions and also some other critical properties, if I have time left. Okay, so thinking about problems of frustrated magnetism, we used to think in terms of uh, spin degrees of freedom, or maybe electron degrees of freedom, whatever, but they are associated with sites, with either particles or nodes of lattice. And the Hamiltonian is also described in the Hilbert space, in the local Hilbert space of such sites. So here I show uh, probably the most simple isotropic Hamiltonian for spin systems, which is Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And as you see, defined by an operator sitting on a lattice node or a lattice site. <coughs> the understanding, however, of the property of the ground state of such Hamiltonian actually more tricky. And in many cases, it turns out that it's good to have a more naive, more simplified idea of what's going on in the wave function. Such example could be a, an exact state uh, decouple of decoupled singlets, such as margin Dargauche chain, where in a spin one half zigzag chain we uh, know that there is exist a point where such decoupled spin one half singlets are actually an exact ground state, but this exact point gives us actually an idea how a ground state looks like around this point where the ground state is no longer exact, but still its property is very close to, to this point. And for spin one, it's a celebrated AKLT state where again we uh, understand the, the phase, the generic property of the Haldane phase in terms of simplified model, in terms of uh, spin one decomposed into a pair of spin one half singlet, uh, of spin one halves, each of which connects via VBS and form a singlet. Such simplified uh, representation on the level of understanding 
actually turn us uh, to uh, to point where we can try to also generalize it to uh, to the simplified model itself. Uh, but before do, do, doing so, let me also mention that in this simplified uh, picture, uh, one can notice that each spin one half belongs to one and only one valence bond singlet, and that's that's crucial in constructing an alternative model, model where we associate local degrees of freedom not with lattice sides, but with the lattice bonds, with the links that sits between two original uh, degrees of freedom. And this model has been proposed long time ago by Rokshin and Kielso, uh, and usually it's defined by the following Hamiltonian, where it, the first term is a hopping term that on a square lattice basically flips uh, dimers on a placket from horizontal to vertical and vice versa, and the last one basically counts the number of flippable plackets. I'll come back to, to the properties of this Hamiltonian later. But you see, this Hamiltonian actually complemented by a local constraint, and it's very similar to what we had before, so there cannot be free nodes. It means that the number of dimers we are using in our system has to be a full covering. We has to connect all nodes of our original lattice by a dimer. And there are no corner sharing dimers. And again, that's what exactly what we set up here. So what does it imply in practice? So here I draw a few uh, configuration on the ladder of allowed and forbidden uh, dimer configuration. So here we have free nodes, corner sharing dimers, but what we also forbid from our consideration, and it will be clear uh, soon, is long standing dimers. So it excludes some of the Hilbert space from our consideration, but it's going to be sufficient for our purposes. Now the question is about Hilbert space. So if we want to treat this part as a not only as a separate model, but also as a simplified version of this one, we need to gain something. And at the naive level, the number of particles for a ladder that was 2n here, n is number of ranks, actually grows. Now it grows as a 3n. So what happens to Hilbert space? Here it grows as a 2 in the power 2n, but here, due to this local constraint, it actually grows much slower. It grows only as a Fibonacci number, which is 1.6 in the power of n. And that's a, an extreme gain we can get from this constraint. Actually, there is a very elegant proof why it is growing as Fibonacci number, why it's so slow. It has been given a long time ago by Martin, Del Tago, and Sierra. So if you consider a ladder with n ranks, its Hilbert space could be goes <coughs> into a Hilbert space of a ladder with n minus 1 ranks times a dimer on the last one, plus the Hilbert space of a ladder with n minus 2 ranks times the two horizontal dimers on the last bucket. But this is nothing but a definition of a Fibonacci number where we sum uh, two last uh, entries of, of, a con of a sequence. Okay, now about physical motivation. So first of all, uh, let's look at spin one half model. So it's nearest and next nearest neighbor on the legs, it's spin on half ladder, and a right interaction, just nearest neighbor obviously, and the phase diagram has been worked out a long time ago by Lavarella and its co his collaborators, and he, they find the transition between columnar diamond phase and the right singlet phase is in Ising universality class, well also a bit of first order, but we are interested mainly in this part. It means that singlet triplet gap remains open, well, system is critical entirely in a singlet sector, so we can discard magnetic excitation and try to simulate system, at least its essential critical properties directly in a singlet sector. So in order to do so, we try this simplified version. So this again, um, Rocha Kilos and Hamiltonian, but now not for a square 2D latches, but only for a 2 like ladder. Again, we have a hopping term, <coughs> and since we break a rotational symmetry, we introduce two uh, different couplings. The one which counts the number of flippable plackets with break leg dimers, and the one which counts the flippable plackets with leg dimers. When V run goes to minus infinity, obviously we sim uh, stabilize this configuration. So we maximize the number of plackets with run dimers. 
and this would be a runtime interface, similar to what we have here. When VLAN goes to minus infinity, we cannot have every placket uh, with a flippable leg dimers because we would have a corner chain of dimers. But we can stabilize it uh, with every outer placket to satisfy the, this constraint. And that would be a columnar dimer phase. And now when both of them are large enough and goes to plus infinity, we actually want to have a least flippable state as possible. And in this configuration it would be a staggered state. But as you can easily see on open boundary condition, this state is actually doesn't appear due to unoccupied uh, uh, nodes. Moreover, even on periodic system, the state is completely decoupled, and it's fair, shifted by one, it's completely decoupled from the rest of the Hilbert space. You cannot apply this uh, transformation to the state and end up in any other state. So it's just, uh, it just decoupled. Therefore, we eliminate it. And the next least flippable state actually contains one flippable placket per three, and it's shown here, so it's period three phase. <coughs> okay, next motivation is again coming from a frustrated magnitude, so it's a phase diagram I showed you last time. It's a nearest and next nearest neighbor spin one chain frustrated by either three-side interaction or by quadratic interaction, both leads to a similar phase diagram, and in both phase diagram, we observe a non-magnetic Ising transition. Again, similar to the previous case, single triplet gap remains open. Everything that happens here happens within a single sector. So we can try to eliminate the magnetic degrees of freedom and try to simulate it within this simplified model. Now, we use this VBS representation of the uh, spin one uh, phases and define a generalization of this constrained quantum diamond model a quantum loop model that now basically mimics a spin one uh, degrees of freedom. So we have two um, quantum dimers that coming out from single site for original lattice. We cannot have uh, quarter sharing dimers more than two of them because it would uh, uh, imply more than two VBS starting at single site. And we count, again, we have very simple, uh, similar uh, hopping term with only difference that now it's. Uh, uh, on a uh, shifted uh, placket, and we count the number of double dimers and single dimers on the nearest neighbor bond. We also exclude a longer range dimers from consideration. So here I show again an example of allowed configuration. And there is yet another model, uh, hard boson model. <coughs> so it's a model, it's a chain, of sites that could be either empty or occupied by a boson. And the constraint is such that we cannot have two bosons sitting on the same sites nor on nearest neighbors. The model has been proposed by uh, Fendis and Gupta and Sajdev uh, in 2004. Uh, and it contains a three term, again, Hopin term, uh, basically chemical potential that counts the total number of bosons in the system and the next nearest neighbor repulsion. Remember, nearest neighbor is just impossible because of constraint. The model actually is very motivated now since recent experiment 2017 on Rydberg atoms. In experiment, they stabilize a set of Rydberg atoms and they excite uh, the atoms into an excited state but there is a strong repulsion between two atoms in excited states. The repulsion uh, scales algebraically, but with very high uh, power, it's uh, L to the 6. And therefore, on a small enough scales, it basically acts as a, an exact constraint, it acts as a blockade that doesn't allow two nearest neighbor particles to be in excited states at the same time. So you see, this really acts as this old model proposed by uh, Fendis and Gupta and such before. Uh, so what's common in all these models are, okay, they all constrain, obviously, but also the Hilbert space in each model grows as a Fibonacci number with a number of particles. And the natural question that arises here, is it only a Hilbert space or actually uh, is there a deeper connection to it? And the answer is the models could be regressed <coughs> to each other. So let me start uh, first by... Uh, showing the mapping 
and uh, also by showing the equivalence of the Hilbert space. So in order to show the equivalence, we start and group a local degrees of freedom into two sectors. Uh, in quantum diamond model, I'll main, mainly consider the first two because then it's easy to generalize. In quantum diamond model, in the first group, I place a placket with two horizontal uh, dimers, and in hard boson, I place a state that is occupied by a boson. My reason is the following. I cannot place two plackets like this next to each other. And at the same time, I cannot place two bosons next to each other by constraint. And here, I put all the, uh, the, the other, all uh, non-used uh, states of a placket or of a site uh, onto, onto Romanian group. And now, either uh, these states can be placed to each other or they can actually follow this site. Uh, now let's consider how it implies actually to Hamiltonian. And let's try to, to uh, map the Hamiltonian, not only the Hilbert space. And in order to do so, I start with a quantum diamond Hamiltonian, and I will try to rewrite every term in terms of hard bosons. So uh, the Hopin term is basically equivalent to this uh, Hopin term in hard bosons. Why? Because what it does, it brings this uh, state in the first group into a state of a second group, and vice versa. And here it's equivalent to creating or annihilating a boson. The last term is very easy. We just count the number of states in the first group, <coughs> and it means that we count the number of bosons in the last. And this one is a bit tricky, because what it does, it uh, counts the number of three consecutive plackets non-occupied by <coughs> a member of the first group. So it counts three consecutive sites non-occupied by hard bosons. And now if we use a translational symmetry and constraint, we can end up with this uh, relation that could be reduced to, to a regional Hamiltonian. It's a very simple uh, algebra to do. Uh, it's very easy to show that it's actually the same is true for also quantum loop model, but at two particular points it's also true for Fibonacci numbers. Now, how to implement this constraint into DMRG? So, as you know, <coughs> DMRG, we write a total Hamiltonian as this uh, uh, product of local uh, matrix product operators. But now, we try to approximate the Bay function as a product of the matrix product states. And on each level, we want to select only those states that are not violating quantum dynamic constraint. I'll be talking mostly about quantum diamond constraint because it's the most easiest to implement. You will see in a moment why. Okay, so the, the, the place to <coughs> modify your algorithm is mostly here when we uh, basically have to select at each uh, matrix product state, we have to select uh, only those blocks that are allowed by the local symmetry. So let me try to give you one particular example. I start to build all possible states of my left environment uh, for quantum diamond model. I start with a single loop egg. It can be either occupied by a diamond or empty. And to uh, build a constraint, I have to introduce my artificial quantum numbers or labels. <coughs> so I choose them in the following way. If I have no empty nodes, I assign zero. If I have some empty nodes, like here, I assign one. Now I add two more uh, legs. And here I don't have much choice because my first leg, uh, rank is occupied. So I have to add empty legs. And I keep my uh, label the same for a moment to be clear why. Here again, I have no much choice. I have to put the dimers onto these legs. Otherwise, my first two nodes will remain unoccupied. And that would be forbidden by symmetry. Now I add yet another rank. And here, I can either add a dimer or an empty rank. Here I don't have any empty uh, nodes, so I assign label zero. Here I have two nodes empty, so a label is one. I don't have much choice here, so I add empty ranks, no free nodes, label zero. I continue. I add two more legs. Not, a, not much choice here, label zero. I have to add two ranks here because otherwise unoccupied uh, uh, nodes. Sorry. And here I have to add empty nodes. And I continue growing my environment 
represents this root. And the first thing that I noticed is that the number of states in the zero sector grows as a Fibonacci number. It's equivalent to having not just environment, but an entire chain of such sites. And therefore, it's in complete agreement with Martin Delgado results. But also, the number of states in sector one grows as a Fibonacci number, but shifted. It implies that the total size, the total Hilbert space for left environment also grows as a Fibonacci number. Okay, that was good news. Now, yet another good news, that every time we add a pair of legs, we have one-to-one -one correspondence of what's on the left and what's on the right. It means that there exists a basis where these matrices on, on legs are actually block identity matrices. So they are trivial in many sense. So while optimizing the energy, we can exclude them. And next, we notice that every time we add a rank to a zero state, we have two possibilities. And every time we add the right rank to one state, we have only one possibility. It defines a very simple fusion group that also works in the thermodynamic limit, it works inside the system, and it starts to truncate the basis, etc. So this is basically defining the a fusion graph of our model. Now, uh, it's not essential, but it turns out to, to give a very good uh, a proof is um, also simplifying a matrix product operator. So instead of doing a simple uh, two-side DMRG, we are doing four-side DMRG. There are two reasons for this. First, as I pointed, uh, tensors on legs are trivial. So optimizing four sides here, I actually optimize only two non-trivial sides. And second, out of 16 possible states, I can filter out those that are not satisfy a constraint locally and end up only with five, which is hard, just slightly harder than spin one half uh, two sides of the energy. Coming back to this picture, so what I show you is actual implementation for quantum dimer model. Of course, one can do it for hard bottom quantum loop model, but implementation is a bit different. For example, here you have to have three uh, different quantum numbers. It makes your block uh, size smaller, but you have three blocks instead of two. Uh, it's a bit non-trivial here and here. This one actually has been done before and it's, um, it's much easier than hard bosons, although the model seems equivalent, because in Fibonacci onions you have a selected direction, direction of grading, and that simplifies the uh, definition of basis states quite, quite significantly. But, okay, my point here is that in all this constraint model, direct implementation is possible, but its complexity is different, like human complexity is different. Okay, so coming back to physical results. These are the phase diagram we get. Uh, let me briefly overview it and then I'll stop into details on, on critical properties. So we have three main phases, a disordered one, here it is, with no hard bosons, and it will be equivalent into a rank diamond phase. This uh, phase, it's like light blue and dark blue is actually the same phase, but it's distinguished by a short range correlation. So here, my <coughs> correlations are incommensurate, but still decays exponentially. Then there is yet another uh, phase, gapped phase, which is period two, or plucket phase, and a period three phase. The critical properties of the phase diagram actually has been debated for quite a while. And Okay, before going to this, sorry, it's a new slide, just added. Uh, so it's actually uh, remarkable that all these three phases have been observed experimentally in Rydberg atoms. So uh, what they've done, uh, they use a 13 atoms chain and they drive a detuning parameter of their laser. And when it's uh, negative <coughs> or small, they see basically this uh, sorry, disordered phase. And then depending on the original spacing between the atoms, they either see period two or period three phases. So it's actually experimentally realizable uh, model, quite rare thing that we have in our state. Okay, coming back to theoretical prediction of, about critical properties of, uh, of this model. So the first study, as I pointed, has been done uh, in 2004 by Fendlis and Gupta and Sajdev, who told that 
transition between Z2 ordered phase and disordered phase is ising and continuous below a track critical ising point, and then a first order above it. Okay, not surprising. Then there are dotted lines that could be solved exactly as integrable lines. Transition between this period three phase and disordered phase is in three state pot universality class when critical line crosses this exact, uh, exactly integrable line. But then the question is which nature of the transition is below and above it? So very far below, actually in the limit of u goes to minus infinity, it has been predicted that it should be through a critical incommensurate phase. So it's, it's a phase where correlation decays algebraically, but at the same time has some oscillation with a non-commensurate wave vector, uh, wave vector non-commensurate with the lattice phase. And above it, it was not cl absolutely clear it could be either first order or chiral or maybe the same incommensurate phase. So uh, better answers worked only in the limit when u goes to minus infinity and there were almost no prediction about it. Very recently, in 2018, uh, Sajdev and uh, his group came back to this model and they prop with exact minimization the transition above the box point. And in particular, they confirm uh, with their results that up to V goes to infinity, the transition remains direct, so no intermediate phase, and chiral, so non-conformal. Uh, non but then, there is a field theory argument presented in the same paper, that it should be the same, so the nature of the transition should be the same around pulse point. So if it is chiral here, it has to be kind of the same here. And then there are big disagreement between these two uh, papers. So we aim to resolve this uh, puzzle. And in order to do so, we actually start to search in the literature and find yet another possibility proposed uh, by Hughes and Fisher in 82 in the context of two-dimensional uh, classical systems. And we need only a part of this, uh, 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 part of this plot. So transition could be through pot point uh, if it's cross integrable line, and then for a while it could remain a chiral transition, and suddenly it splits into two costalitalis and Pokrovsky talop of transition with intermediate and commensurate phase in between. Uh, the reason for this is the following. So, studying by asymmetric uh, three state pots model, they notice that if they combine domain walls, different domain walls, and then permute them, the result is different, sorry, they combine different domains and look at the domain walls between them. So when they permute them, the domain wall change its nature. So let's look here. It means that basically ABC is not equal to ACB uh, sets of, of domains. And therefore, the name was Chiron. So yeah, it's just a large part of the figure. We have pause point. And then we can have chiral transition for a while, according to the field theory, and then we can have an emergent intermediate phase. Interesting that this problem actually attracted a lot of attention in the 70s and 80s. It has been studied, has been obtained by, almost obtained by uh, Quantum Monte Carlo for asymmetric uh, clock model. So due to a huge error bar, it was very difficult to conclude whether the C really is in commensurate phase or not, but it's it's a very good indication that it's there. It's uh, it's pretty convincing. Okay, so we have all this, and now we try to do numerics. So how we can distinguish between these three cases, uh, three state points, uh, chiral, and uh, uh, well, two-step process. The two-step process means Costelli-Zales and pokrovsky talop and the good quantity to look at is actually a product of delta Q a distance between an incommensurate wave vector to its commensurate value 2 pi over 6 because we are looking to period 3 phase. So when we have a three state pot point, uh, critical behavior is described by conformal field theory and we know uh, critical exponents exactly and we know that the one uh, of delta Q is actually twice larger than uh, the one with which uh, correlation layers diverges. So the product of this <coughs> should go to zero. For chiral transition, it's non-conformal, and the critical exponent is not known. 
What we know is just a, an interval that it should be somewhere between 0 0.8 and 1. But it's important that it has to be the same for both delta Q and Xi. And it means that the product of the two goes to some, uh, some constant volume. Whether or not it's a uh, universal, it's a question, but then it's not, not zero and not divergence. And what happens when we have intermediate phase? When we go from a disordered phase into a period three phase, what happens first, we hit a costulate Zales transition, transition at which correlation length diverges exponentially. But correlation vector, incommensurate wave vector, remains finite. So the product of the two diversion diverges fast. So let's look what we get. And to do so, we take three distinct cut, cuts. Well, in, in the paper, you can actually find that we made almost 20 different cuts all around uh, this uh, transition. Here, I'll present only three. One across the POTS point, one close to it, and one very far from it. So here is the results. The middle one would be for pods. This one would be very far from it, and this one would be close but away from it. I measure three different quantities. Inverse of the correlation length, wave vector Q, and the product I discussed, the delta Q and Xi. So when I have a pods point, you see a correlation length, inverse of the correlation length vanishes at a single point. So if I try to fit separately left and right part of the curves, I find there is no intermediate uh, distance between the two and also critical exponents are pretty close to each other of course uh, it wouldn't be the case if I have two different transitions such as cos to Zales and pokrovsky talapo also uh, when I try to fit uh, wave vector Q approaching 2 pi over 3 commensurate values uh, I get a cor almost correct critical exponent uh, in comparison to CFT prediction and the product of these two values definitely goes to zero. Well, this is a known value, so it's just a benchmark of our method. But you already see that we have to go to very uh, close to the transition and to reach very uh, high accuracy in both Q vector and the correlation length, so it required us extremely large uh, system size, as you will see in a moment. So we went up to 9,000 uh, ranks. Uh, on the very far from, uh, from the transition, sorry, oh, very far from POTS point, here we see very different behavior. So on the left we have exponential growth of the correlation length, so inverse decays very fast. And on the, on the other side we have pokrovsky talapov transition that has a critical exponent one half, very small, so it's very steep uh, decay of uh, one over xi. Moreover, if we try to fit, uh, we get actually some finite interval in between these two. Well, it's very small, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, now, if we try to fit also a, a wave vector, uh, we get a critical exponent also similar to pokrovsky talapov one half, of course, with some errors here. And the product of these two, as you can see, we have large error bars, but there is no doubt that uh, it diverges and diverges before uh, we actually hit the pokrovsky talapov transition. On another side, very close to uh, uh, POTS point, we still see a uh, kind of direct transition. We still see no uh, presence of the intermediate phase. It's almost symmetric uh, how wave function, uh, how inverse of the correlation lines decay, and it doesn't necessarily has to be symmetric explicitly because the, in front of the uh, power law we have some non-universal constant, but the powers actually very, very close to each other. Uh, it's rather difficult to fit and extract critical exponent for delta xi because it's extremely close to a commensurate value. But within the error bar, we can safely conclude that it tends to some finite value and not to zero, no divergence. So we indeed can detect the presence of the chiral transition here. And it was actually a big surprise and pleasure to know that uh, this kind of uh, transition has been observed experimentally in 90s uh, also in the context of 2D classical problems, where they uh, measure exactly the product of Q times Xi and see some finite uh, uh, values uh, close to the transition. So again, it's experimentally realizable results, which is very nice. Uh, now, if you try to plot uh, both critical exponents and the width of the correlation, uh, width of this intermediate phase, uh, we get the following plot. So close to the pot's point, uh, critical exponents uh, 
well, it remains more or less the same for both sides of the transition, but then it starts to approach on one side Kokrovsky Talap of critical exponent one half, and on another side it just grows very fast, which would be like a poor estimate with power law of exponential growth. And the uh, width of the critical phase is extremely narrow, but at the same time it agrees with the better ansatz prediction made in the original paper by Henry, as in the plan such there. Okay, let's now look inside the critical phase. And here what I show is uh, an occupation number of uh, bosons or uh, plackets with uh, uh, rung dimers in a finite size chain with open boundaries. You see it's a rather big one, 3,000, 3,600 uh, ranks. Uh, open boundary induce um, uh, fixed boundary condition, so it favors dim or dimers of the first and last ranks. And in critical system, it acts as a fixed boundary condition, therefore induce Friedel oscillations. Uh, in the absence of uh, uh, incommensurability, we know the envelope of this Friedel oscillation basically would be given by this denominator here. But on top of the uh, envelope, we have uh, oscillation, we have incommensurate uh, oscillations, and simply by adding this cosine on top, we can actually fit them pretty well. So blue dots are demarchidata, and red dots would be a fit to the CFT prediction, well, generalized to incommensurate uh, correlation. And you see that apart from very close to boundary, the fit is nearly, nearly perfect. Uh, also, what you can notice here is that, well, top plot is for, uh, for a critical phase on the b below post point, and the bottom plot is for a critical phase above post point, but you will see that here we have uh, uh, much better uh, wave vector Q, so it's much easier to see many oscillations than in this one, because this Q vector is very, is extremely close to its commensurate value. So in finite size chain, even on such a long one, you have just a few helices to observe. And it basically explains why this has been overlooked with exact diagonalization. So for V equal 20, as shown here, we estimate the first system size at which you start to, look, to, to see some uh, oscillation, at least one single helix, about 1,000 sites. It's just unreachable with exact analyzation. And the reason for this is actually here. So here I plot equal Q lines starting uh, between uh, 0 0.66 pi and 68 pi. And you see that on this side, uh, below both points, they actually condense. So my Q vector changes very fast within a short uh, parameter range. Well, on this side, but, uh, it uh, remains actually quite a little huge. Uh, what we also measure inside the critical phase <coughs> is, of course, uh, central charge. And also, to do it uh, properly, we have to uh, eliminate uh, uh, oscillations. There are no nice way of doing it. So what we just hope is if we go to a very fastly oscillating wave function, which means not too close to commensurate value, uh, it was uh, for this particular point, we can just uh, neglect them, they will average out, and the slope we get is uh, actually in a good agreement with uh, central charge one predicted for Latin liquid inside this critical phase. But we cannot actually perform it numerically here just because we have too few helices accessible and therefore uh, this nice averaging doesn't work in this particular case. Okay. So I'll discuss uh, the, uh, the nature of the transition around this point. As you now know, it is indeed a three-state pulse uh, point when uh, the integrable line hits a critical line, as it has been predicted a long time ago. And then around this point, but not too far from it, we believe it's in chiral transition. And on both sides and far from this transition, till infinity, we go into two-step process. We first go through a costly dollars transition, then we have very narrow intermediate phase, and then Pokrovsky talop of commensurate and commensurate transition to period three phase. I have some time, good. Now let's look at another transition. So our original motivation, if you remember, was uh, can we actually simulate Ising transition or magnetic Ising transition in, in a simplified models? Okay, here I show proof that we indeed have Ising transition between this uh, period two, whatever it is, in any language we uh, define it, and disordered phase. So first what we uh, plot here is uh, occupation number of a dimer in the middle of the chain 
uh, <coughs> sorry, wrong. So I define the memorization. The memorization would mean a difference between occupation number of two consecutive plockets with, with two consecutive horizontal diameters. Uh, I compute it in the middle of a finance chain and I look at the finance scaling of it. Uh, when it goes down, I end up in a disordered phase. When it goes to finite value, I end up in a uh, period two phase, you know, in a, in a uh, broken symmetry phase. And I associate a transition with separatrix, and the slope gives me a critical exponent, which is not too far from uh, CFT prediction 1.8. Uh, alternatively, I can extract critical exponent also looking by the Friedel oscillation. Again, open boundary, it turns out that open boundary favors dimerization, uh, sorry, favors uh, uh, first and last ranks to be occupied by a dimer. And therefore, this occupation decays towards the, uh, the middle of the chain. And by fitting it with this envelope, now no incommensurate oscillation, so everything looks nice. With envelope, we extract critical exponent, and again, it agrees pretty well with uh, CFT. We also extract a uh, uh, scaling of uh, entanglement entropy and extract central charge, which also in agreement with uh, uh, Ising prediction one half. Uh, so it means that basically we indeed confirm that this very tricky in the context of frustrated magnetism, Ising transition can be captured much easier using these constrained models. And so, as soon as we identify the nature of the phases, we can construct its uh, VBS representation. And based on it, we can try to simulate it uh, in, uh, in a simplified model, in a constrained model. So uh, this is the same phase diagram, but plotted in original uh, variables uh, for quantum dimer model. And yeah, it reproduces uh, Ising transition uh, uh, very well. <coughs> and again, the same. <coughs> phase diagram uh, written in terms of, um, uh, of a quantum loop model. And uh, again, as you see, it reproduces a transition between the next nearest neighbor Hellman phase and dimerized phase through Ising transition very well. But there is actually yet another thing to point here. This one, it has never been predicted. Uh, it has never been observed in spin on chain. And uh, we know actually a period three phase in, uh, in spin on chain has been uh, uh, predicted a long time ago by yeah, Tsuga Sensei and his collaborators. Uh, so this is a gapped period three phase, and this is double Halden phase, which is the same as next nearest neighbor Halden phase. Transition between the two has been uh, observed to, to be a first order transition based on single triplet calculation. But in principle, as we now know, there, there is a possibility that criticality actually occurs inside singlet sector. So indeed, single triple gap could remain open, but we can have actually something deeper inside. Uh, yeah, I want to actually point that it's extremely difficult to prove. <laughs> it's it's very difficult model to simulate, and uh, okay, it's ongoing project. <laughs> but uh, it would be nice to actually to see what's going on there. So what is the double for that phase? It's the same as next nearest neighbor Halden phase. Okay. So yeah, it's like two Halden phases sitting on on other sides. Uh, okay, so we consider this uh, critical phase Ising, and what's left is a tricritical Ising point. And why it is special? Because at this particular point, we can actually map system onto a Fibonacci ion chain. Uh, but it's also special because it is one of the rare cases when a position of the tricritical Ising model is known exactly and when we can actually do simulation of very large system sizes for critical systems. It means that we can actually probe a prediction, boundary field correspondence prediction made by Ian Affleck for tricriticalizing point a long time ago and has never been observed numerically until now. So we profit from uh, first constraint Hilbert space and second known position to probe it. So why it is different, what's, uh, what's unusual about it? In Ising critical theory, in Ising minimal model, we have only three types of uh, conformally invariant boundary condition. It's either free or fixed, fixed up or fixed down. And if we have something intermediate in our real system, it basically flows uh, into one of the three. However, for tricritical Ising theory, 
On top of this tree, we can actually have yet another pair of conformally invariant boundary conditions, which is partially up and partially down. So let's try to first establish a boundary field correspondence, a correspondence between Ising uh, boundary condition and our model's boundary condition for a fixed this first three, which are easier, and then see whether we can actually simulate and get this partially fixed boundary condition. So the fixed boundary condition in Ising, uh, I, I will refer always to anti-ferromagnetic Ising just for quality. So in anti-ferromagnetic Ising model, we have pattern like up, down, up, down. And it's similar to our quantum dimer model, having or not having uh, double dimers. And therefore, <coughs> fixing a boundary condition here will also correspond to fixing a state in this particular up or down empty or occupied uh, sites on this side. But then, if I consider anti-ferromagnetic or, yeah, sorry, actually this one is for ferromagnetic ising, now I realize. So in ferromagnetic ising, I can uh, favor two edges to be in the same direction and therefore in the middle I don't have this butterfly structure but I have a smooth spectrum, the one we already see. But here, since I have to have a period two pattern, I have to have even number of sites to have a symmetric uh, envelope. By contrast, when I have opposite direction uh, in, in Ising field, I have something like a butterfly structure in my edge, uh, Friedel oscillation. And butterfly structure is realized here when I have odd number of plaquettes. Uh, a free boundary condition corresponds to non-having uh, plaquettes, and therefore it corresponds to rank dimer. And combined, for example, up and down, basically is the same as combined. And it doesn't matter whether I combine up and zero or down and zero, it just gives the same. Uh, then there, there were prediction for these uh, uh, types of models, so it's just a CFT different uh, primary field that correspond to a spectral excitation spectrum for this uh, fixed boundary condition. So we try to now fix boundary condition in our system and try to see these conformal towers inside. So in order to get conformal towers, I follow basically the method I described last week, and uh, basically it's also uh, summarized here. Uh, so I compute many uh, excitation levels, many energy excitation levels, and see how it scales with the system size, with inverse of the system size. First, the fact that they scale linearly means that I have conformal system, and the structure of it uh, basically corresponds to every specific conformal tower, every specific primary field. Uh, you see, sometimes we have actually a combination of two conformal towers, so uh, here I have several. And again, uh, to compare, Blue dots are always DMRG data, and lines, colored lines, would be safety prediction. So the agreement is perfect. It means that we identified our fixed boundary condition or free boundary condition in a good way. Now, what about this partially polarized boundary condition? Uh, so again, this part has been worked out by Affleck, and uh, obviously, when we try to uh, understand what, what is partially up or partially down, the first guess would be it's just a weak, not fully polarized uh, up, but with a with small boundary field, with a small, with a boundary field that uh, favors, but not, not too strongly, uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, placket on the first and last side. And the same for the rest. And since we don't not know at which exactly field, at which exactly boundary field we actually stabilize the spectra, we tune this boundary field. So here I show a spectra for 240 sites. Uh, when boundary field is too small, it's uh, very negative, and it means actually that we favor rank uh, dimers on, on the first and last rank, we have one structure of the spectrum. When boundary field favors uh, two uh, placket dimers, oh sorry, uh, leg dimers, we have another structure of the spectrum that cor would correspond to fixed boundary condition here. But in between, it doesn't go smoothly uh, or continuously to, uh, to from one spectrum to another, but we go through some intermediate spectrum which actually corresponds to this uh, weak, uh, critical, uh, weak boundary conditions, not fully polarized. So if I 
take the best approximate for this uh, uh, point if I identify a boundary field at which my spectrum is actually matches uh, uh, matches exactly the uh, CFT prediction I can also compute all possible variation or possible combination between this partially polarized boundary condition with itself or with free or with uh, fully polarized and you see I basically can probe all uh, possible primary fields that appear in this tricritical Isaac minimal model so it's a uh, kind of nice contribution to Sorry. this old predictive result yeah. between those two kind of export fits the uh, here and here yeah yeah, yeah. is it a motif thing you know partially up partially down what mean how can you decide how can you say um, it's up or down imagine Isaac model just Isaac model so you have uh, you have a six a six interaction and a z interaction uh, not interaction sorry a z field and now on the first and last side you start to tune your sd field and you tune it from negative to positive sure. so in principle your states followed by this boundary field right so they are polarized along this boundary field but not fully polarized you don't fix boundary can be polarizing, but with small, uh, with small polarization. With some probability, it's polarized up, and with some probability, it's polarized down. So it's kind of like a multiple of both in some time. Y yes, you can think about it like a local superposition, right? But it's a local one. So when I think it takes place on, on one side, and here it takes place on one black. So you, you change local, you change edge field. Uh, field is not um, is not so drastic. You can try to try to impose constraint on polarization. It's just in the image it's much more harder, and then change this constraint until you find the best. From a field theory point of view, it's very easy. So you always draw you know fixed points, <laughs> and then uh, okay, here you have one more fixed point, and you don't care where this fixed point is actually located. You don't care in the works. Okay, basically that's it. Uh, so, what I show you today, uh, physics-wise, a transition between period three phase and uh, disordered phase could be of three different types. It could be either uh, three-state pots point if we know that uh, our wave vector is fixed to two pi over three. It could be direct and chiral, which means non-conformal transition, or it could be through uh, intermediate incommensurate phase, critical incommensurate phase, and therefore it's two-step process. So first we get the costal Isaac transition, and then commensurate incommensurate Pokrovsky Talov transition. Uh, regarding numerics, uh, constraint models not so difficult to implement, but the gain is enormous. Uh, the number of uh, uh, sites we can reach is actually uh, very large, and uh, also you see. Uh, all correlations, all uh, uh, wave vector Q, we can uh, compute uh, with, a, uh, with very high accuracy. Uh, and also, there are many mappings between the models. Also, probably besides the simple uh, models I show you, also probably for larger, uh, well, still 1D and 2D, we believe it doesn't exist, but uh, for probably many like ladders, it could still be possible to find some models that would map to each other. And for track critical point, uh, as I told you, it's identical to Fibonacci annual chains, but also we can probe partial polarized boundary condition pretty a long time ago. With this, I would like to thank you for attention. Excuse me. You showed the uh, quasi state of the tricritical Eisen, uh, five quasi states, but if I remember correctly, there are six uh, quasi states in tricritical. Eisen CFT in in Alfred's paper, right? In tricritical? Yes. There are six primary fields in tricritical CFT and there are six um, conformal invariant boundary conditions. And which would be the sixth one? Sixth one is uh, a very unstable uh, in the uh, Alfred's paper he said he calls that uh, degenerate uh, boundary con boundary states. Oh, I didn't remember it. Okay, yeah, I'll look for it. Oh. Are you talking about the one for which the Boltzmann wave can be scared? No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.
for uh, tripartical icing and uh, three step boss, did you calculate the uh, central charge? Yes, yes, I believe it's in the paper. Well, it was uh, in very good agreement. Okay. I, I think within 0.1%. Okay. But I, think, I remember that one is 0.7, the, the other one is 0.8. So it's very cross. Yes, but location is known. Okay. No, it's, uh, I think for ports we have something like 0 0.8001 mm -hmm. and for uh, uh, try critical, I think it's also, it's, yeah, it's very good uh, precision. But of course you don't have such precision when you don't know the location precisely, so it's, uh, it was just a very lucky case. Just a technical question, mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about like using the, the the constraint method, but in the in the IDMRG context, I mean you, you can simulate a very large system size. In system principle, size. yeah. I mean it's easy to generalize, right? But uh, I uh, just with previous experience realized that uh, DMRG is extremely powerful for critical system when combined with boundary components of theory. But, uh, but I agree that for this particular case uh, of uh, when I plot correlation lens. Mm -hmm. uh, you can argue, I agree. Uh, I mean, uh, my strategy was that I take uh, fixed uh, system sizes like 6,000, 9,000 ranks, but then I, I converge it to uh, my truncation error like vanishing, mm -hmm. minus 2 or whatever, or minus 10 or something. But of course, you can do it with infinite sized DMRG, but then you never reach conversions, right? You have to extrapolate, mm -hmm. just alternative. Uh, can you remind us how, how you knew where the tri-criticalizing model was? Sorry? Can you remind us how you knew the location of the tri -critical? Oh, it's, uh, it's located on the uh, integrable line solved by beta and dots. So the dash line is? Yes, it, this dotted line are uh, integrable line on both sides, so the location of the three state ports and uh, tri critical ports <coughs> is known. So you can get this whole spectrum from data on so you have, Is there some reason to do DMRG? For this particular point, no. Uh, but uh, for boundary fields, I'm pretty sure you cannot do everything with better on that. Mm -hmm. And also for this point, uh, we need a be benchmark for our results below and above it. And also there were no doubts on this point. Some experiments realize there are con some constraining model. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, uh, what kind of constraining model should be reasonable to uh, account for experiments. Uh, I think by now the most promising one is hard bosons because it's just Rydberg atoms. So it's one to one correspondence between them. So it's not your, it's not your behavior of B term in this term. Yes, I actually see it. So, I don't have the plot here, but uh, indeed they. So they, in principle, I think they, they can very hardly by probe several points in between. They cannot unit continuously, but they. Uh, so they can fix uh, the distance between the particles, in uh, more, well, probably not in a continuous way, but more or less in a, in many small steps and therefore they can in principle go in this direction as well. So only one particle is allowed. <coughs> no, no, no. Here for example every time you see a light uh, yellow color you have an uh, excited state.